We'll be looking at the life of John Bunyan today, since Pastor Joel is going to be starting a Sunday school series through the Pilgrim's Progress. We thought it would be a good idea to give a sketch of his life. That's hard to cram the life of someone like John Bunyan into 35, 40 minutes, so we'll try to do what we can this morning. Uh, I want to begin by reading a verse from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, as we consider the life of Uh, especially the sufferings and the providential workings of God in the life of a man like John Bunyan. Romans 8 to 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we are again thankful for this Lord's Day that we have been given. God, as we have feasted on thy word, O oh God, please create faith and sustain it within us, O oh Lord. Please increase our faith. And now as we turn to study the life of thy servant, John Bunyan, help us to be edified in seeing the great works which thou hast done in his life, O oh Lord, and thou art continuing to work in us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So as we said, Pastor Joel is set, I think, next week to begin leading us on an extended study of the Pilgrim's Progress beginning next week. So we're going to give a sketch now of the man who wrote it, the life of the man who wrote it, the famed nonconformist Puritan minister John Bunyan. Nonconformist means he did not conform to the state church, the church of England at that time. And although I used the titles nonconformist and Puritan, and though they are helpful in so far as they help us locate Bunyan ecclesiastically and historically, He himself desired to be known by only one title. Later in life, when he was pressed by certain of his strict Baptist brethren, who were suspicious of his ecumenical spirit toward his paedo-baptist friends, Bunyan said this, quote, Since you would know by what name I would be distinguished from others, I tell you I would be and hope I am a Christian. That's what he wanted to be known as and to live his life as, a Christian. And here at the outset, we note something of Bunyan's gentle, loving, and unschismatic Christian spirit. One author, Reverend Offer, noted that Bunyan's church at Bedford, England, was, quote, congregational in name, Anabaptist in right, or credo-baptist in right, and ecumenical in the fellowship of saints and the communion of love, end quote. While Bunyan was himself, convictionally, as far as we can tell, a credo-baptist, the Bedford Church minutes, uh, which Bunyan pastored, note that he often performed infant baptisms for the families in his church who were otherwise minded. So by all accounts, Bunyan was a man of true Christian love and charity. And it's little wonder, therefore, that such a book like The Pilgrim's Progress came from such a man as this. Pastor Joel will likely give more information, background information, and just interesting information about the Pilgrim's Progress next week in the introduction. So for now, we'll only give some of the most bare statistics. Bunyan wrote 68 books, but the Pilgrim's Progress is his most famous work, if we could even call it famous, infamous might be better. Historian S.M. Houghton notes that famous is too weak a word to use about this book. The Pilgrim's Progress is known and loved the whole world over. Outside the Bible, in fact, the Pilgrim's Progress is the best-selling book of all time. Not just of Christian literature, but of all time. The Pilgrim's Progress has been translated into over 200 languages, and though it was despised by much of the educated elite of the day when it first appeared in 1678, It was always popular with the common people who heard Bunyan gladly. It immediately passed through three editions in the first year, and within a hundred years, intellectuals in England who studied literature all recognized what the common people already knew. The Pilgrim's Progress was the best English allegory ever written. The Pilgrim's Progress has had a wide impact on Christendom since its publication. It has been loved and studied and used by myriads of famed ministers and lay people alike. Here's a sampling of some famed ministers and what they had to say about it. 
The Anglican evangelist of the Great Awakening, George Whitfield, said, quote, The pilgrim's progress is read with the greatest pleasure. End quote. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, said, quote, I find this book so full of matter that I can seldom go through more than a page or half a page at a time. End quote. It was the favorite book outside of the Bible <clears throat> of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who wrote, quote, Next to the Bible, the book I value most is John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I believe I have read it through at least a hundred times. It is a volume of which I never seem to tire, and the secret of its freshness is that it is so largely compiled from the scriptures. It is really biblical teaching put into the form of a simple yet very striking allegory, end quote, C.H. Spurgeon. Our own J. Gresham Machen of the OPC said, quote, that tenderest and most theological of books is pulsating with life in every word, end quote. Who then was the man that God continues to so greatly use through this book? What providences made him the author that Christendom so adores and the world so admires? Well, let's look at some descriptions about John Bunyan by those who knew him in his own day. His friend John Wilson said that Bunyan was, quote, grave and composed in looks and in a manner and was ever likely to strike something of awe into those who lacked God's fear in their hearts, end quote. So just by looking at the guy, you got a sense that you needed to know God. That's the kind of man that John Bunyan was, according to one of his closest friends, John Wilson. Dr. George Koken said, quote, he was stern and rugged to look upon, but was mild and gentle in his conversation. He continues, Bunyan was not a ready talker unless he had somewhat to say. But he loved to foster friendship with all. He was tall, strong of limb, fresh-faced, with a mustache after the old British fashion. His hair had been reddish, but was sprinkled with gray. He had a good forehead, a well-set nose, and a large mouth, and his eyes were full of sparkle." End quote. Now, I don't know uh, if we would want people describing us when we pass as having a good forehead, but certainly his eyes being full of sparkle communicates something of the life and uh, vitality of this man. John Bunyan was born on the 30th of November, 1628, in the town of Elstow, a mile south of Bedford, England. In the same year, William Laud became the Bishop of London under the reign of Charles I. Now, anyone who is familiar with the history of the Westminster Divines or the history of England already understands the importance of this event. We cannot underestimate or we can't understand the political and religious climate in which Bunyan lived, why he and other Puritans suffered so greatly in England at that time without understanding how momentous Laud's bishopric was. These were the days of the conflict between Parliament and the King. Uh, as one one biographer summed up this time saying, quote, Bishop Laud, together with Charles I, opposed the reforms to the Church of England proposed by the Puritans. Oliver Cromwell was elected to Parliament in 1640, and civil war broke out in 1642 between the forces loyal to the king and those loyal to Parliament. In 1645, the Parliament took control of the monarchy. Bishop Laud was executed that year, and the imposition of the Book of Common Prayer was overthrown. The Westminster Assembly completed the Westminster Standards in 1646, and King Charles I was beheaded in 1649. Cromwell led the new Commonwealth until his death in 1658, and Cromwell brought stable government and freedom of religion to the Puritans." End quote. So this was a tumultuous time. I mean, the king was beheaded. That sent shockwaves through the entirety of the kingdom at that time. The king wasn't just imprisoned. He wasn't just uh, gotten out of office. He was beheaded publicly. This is a crazy thing to get your mind around. 
It was into this climate that John Bunyan was born and through which he lived. Bunyan's parents were poor, but they were not destitute. His father was a tinker, one who worked in in metal, one who fixed plows and and yokes and axes and, and shovels. Bunyan was sent to school by his parents early on, where he learned nothing more than to read and write. And he confesses later on, quote, I did soon lose that little that I learned in school, end quote. He was primarily trained up in his father's trade of tinker, or brazier, as it was called back then. In 1644, when Bunyan was 15, both his mother and his sister died in the same year. His dad, a month later, remarried. Later that fall, when Bunyan was 16, he was drafted into Cromwell's parliamentary army. He spent two years in the military. Much of what he saw and experienced in the military no doubt inspired many of the characters and scenes that we find in Pilgrim's Progress and his other allegory, The Holy War. Bunyan was not raised in a pious home. He described it as more of a poor home than a pious home. And he remained an unbeliever at that time in the military, having, as he describes himself, quote, few equals for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. I was a ringleader in all manner of vice and ungodliness, end quote. In 1646, the army was disbanded and Bunyan returned to being a tinker. In the year 1649, when he was 20 or 21, we're not quite sure, Bunyan married his first wife. And her name, we actually still don't know. We don't know the name of his first wife. All we do know is that she too was poor. But unlike Bunyan, she came from a pious, godly home. And her dowry, the only thing she came with, she didn't come with money, she came with two Puritan books that her father had left her when he died namely Arthur Dent's The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven and Lewis Bailey's The Practice of Piety. So she brings these two books with her as her dowry. And Bunyan began to sit and read these books with his wife. And she was helping him learn or relearn how to read at that time. And at the same time, God was beginning to work on him. Their first child, Mary, was born blind. They had three other children together, Elizabeth, John, and Thomas. We are unsure of the exact moment. Actually, reading the narrative is kind of frustrating because you think John John Bunyan has come to faith, and then he says that he hasn't yet, and there seems to be all these different moments of conversion. But we're not sure of the exact moment, but sometime during the first five years of marriage, Bunyan was profoundly converted. In 1653, he moved his family to Bedford, to join the Baptistic Nonconformist Church, pastored by John Gifford. Best that we can tell, it was shortly after joining the Bedford congregation that Bunyan experienced the new birth. Under the influence of Reverend Gifford, while daily reading the scriptures and Luther's comment on Galatians, one of the only books that he had access to, and pouring his soul out to God in prayer daily, Bunyan found peace and salvation in Jesus Christ. He writes about the experience the following words, quote, One day, as I was passing into the field, this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And methought withal, I saw the eyes of my soul, Jesus Christ, at God's right hand. There, I say, was my righteousness. So that whenever I, wherever I was and whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, He wants my righteousness. For that was just before him. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame of heart that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons. My temptations also fled away. So that from that time, those dreadful scriptures of God, he's speaking about the ones that talk about committing the unpardonable sin, he kept thinking that he had committed that, 
So from that time on, those dreadful scriptures of God left off to trouble me. Now went I also home rejoicing for the grace and love of God, end quote. In 1655, seeing his great transformation in Christ and his rapid growth in the things of God, his pastor, Reverend Gifford, asked Bunyan to exhort the church, and a great preacher was discovered in the man, John Bunyan. Bunyan continued receiving invitations to preach in churches, barns, fields, and various gatherings of Puritans, not only around Bedford, but even in the capital city of London. John Brown tells us that, quote, when the country learned that the tinker had turned preacher, they came to hear the word by hundreds and from all parts, end quote. Bunyan's great fame as a preacher would remain all of his life even having large groups of people visiting, visiting him in prison, which he would give sermons to them from the goal in prison. One historian notes that later in his life, if only a single day's notice was given that Bunyan would be preaching in London the next morning, a crowd of no less than 1,200 would be waiting for him at 5 a.m. on a workday in the dead of winter. That's how bad people wanted to hear John Bunyan preach. Often, uh, often found in these crowds was none other than the, the great illustrative Puritan intellectual of the age, John Owen. King Charles II once asked John Owen why he, a great scholar, probably the greatest scholar in England and maybe one of the greatest scholars and intellects of Christendom, period, why he, John Owen, went to hear this uneducated tinker prate, prattle, say nonsense. John Owen answered the king, saying, quote, I would willingly exchange all my learning for the tinker's power of touching men's hearts, end quote. God would now lay hard providences upon his servant, John Owen. In 1658, Bunyan's first wife died. This same year, Cromwell died, and his son, Richard Cromwell, took over as protector. But... Richard was a weak leader, and he was unable to hold the government together. Parliament began turning against the nonconformists, against the Puritans, and passed a series of acts that restricted Puritan preachers. Bunyan married his second wife, Mary, in 1659, and they were soon pregnant with a child. But these initial joys would soon be overshadowed. In 1660, King Charles II was brought home, and the monarchy was restored. On the 12th of November of that same year, John Bunyan was arrested while leading a service, and he was held for preaching without state approval. Mary was seven months pregnant at the time, and when she heard the news, she went into labor and miscarried eight days later. Bunyan was brought to the Bedford County Prison, where he sat for two months without trial. Finally, he was brought before five county magistrates who told him that if he just promised to leave off preaching and return to the Church of England services, then they would let him go. But that if he did not leave off preaching, he would be thrown back into prison. And if he continued preaching in prison, they would stretch his head from off his neck. Bunyan responded, quote, if I'm out of prison today, I will preach the gospel again tomorrow by the help of God. So he went back for 12 years into prison. Throughout his imprisonment, he, his wife Mary, which she deserves an entire study in itself. This is an amazing, godly woman. He, his wife Mary, and many others made appeals to the courts for his freedom. And it all came down to the same thing every time. All Bunyan had to do was swear never to preach again. And then he could be free. His freedom was his. If he just wanted it, that was the only condition. But Bunyan, like many of the Puritans, was just made of something different, wasn't he? During his imprisonment, concerning their conditions for his release, he'd been in prison many years at this point, he wrote, quote, If nothing will do, unless I make of my conscience a continual butchery and slaughter shop, unless putting out mine own eyes, I commit me to the blind to lead me, as I doubt not is desired by some people, I have determined 
that Almighty God, being my help and shield, yet to suffer. If frail life might continue so long, even till the moss shall grow on mine eyebrows, rather than thus to violate my faith and principles. End quote. Keep me in here until the moss grows up over me. I will not concede. I will not go against my faith and principles. Similar to his favorite theologian, Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. Though Bunyan was firm in principle and strong in faith, the suffering of prison was nonetheless intense, especially the separation from his family and especially being separated from his blind daughter, Mary, who was so dear to his heart. Quote, the parting with my wife and poor children hath often been to me in this place as the pulling of, my f- of the flesh from my bones. And that not only because I am somewhat too fond of these great mercies, but also because I should have often brought to my mind the many hardships, miseries, and wants that my poor family was like to meet with, with should I be taken from them, especially my poor blind child, who lay nearer my heart than I had all besides. Oh, the thoughts of the hardship I thought my Mary would, might go under would break my heart to pieces. End quote. He often worried and doubted whether he was doing the right thing by his family. Maybe he should just give in. I won't preach anymore. And then I can go back to my family. But he nevertheless remained steadfast in his principles. If they release me today, I will preach tomorrow. So he did what he could. He made uh, leather boot laces and different straps while in prison to try to support his family. In 1662, the Act of Uniformity was passed that required acceptance of the prayer book and Episcopal ordination. That August, as many of you know, 2,000 Puritans were ejected from their churches. They were forced out of their pulpits, over 2,000 Puritan pastors. Twelve years later, there was a happy turn of affairs with the Declaration of Religious Indulgence that resulted in Bunyan's release in 1672. He was then licensed to preach, and he was called as the pastor of the Congregationalist Church in Bedford, where he had joined and been saved. Although political instability remained until his death in 1688, the last 16 years of Bunyan's life were some of the most fruitful. He was imprisoned one other time afterwards in 1677 for a winter and a spring, so for about six months, until with John Owen's help, he was released. And now it was during this last imprisonment, the six-month-long one, that he wrote the first part of the Pilgrim's Progress, which was published in 1678. The same year, he sent his Come and Welcome to Jesus Christ to the press. In 1680, he published The Life and Death of Mr. Badman, which was another allegory that was very helpful to uh, Dr. Joel Beakey. He said when he was a young boy and he was raiding his father's bookshelf, he was about 12 years old, he's raiding his father's bookshelf full of Puritan works. He sees a book titled The Life and Death of Mr. Badman. And he goes, well, I'm a bad boy. Maybe I should read that. And that was helpful to his conversion. In 1682, he published The Holy War. And in 1684, he published the second part of Pilgrim's Progress. Bunyan, a man with no formal education, continued to write and and indeed pump out classics of English Puritan spirituality until the day he died, publishing four books in the last year of his life. He also continued to travel and to preach God's word to large crowds all throughout England. In August of 1688, he accepted an invitation to preach in London. He traveled some 50 miles in freezing rain, preached his last sermon on August 19th, contracted a fever, and on August 31st, 1688, only at the age of 60, away from his family, Bunyan, quote, followed his pilgrim from the city of destruction across the river to the New Jerusalem, end quote. His last words, spoken to the many who were gathered around his deathbed, sum up his deep an abiding trust in Christ and his tender love for Christ's people. Quote, Weep not for me, but for yourselves. I go to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will, no doubt, through the mediation of his blessed Son, receive me, though a sinner. 
where I hope we ere long shall meet to sing the new song and remain everlastingly happy, world without end. Then we read these words, uh, written by somebody who was there. Quote, after telling his friends that his greatest desire was to be with Christ, he raised his hands to heaven and cried, Take me, for I come to thee. And then he died. Let's look at some hints and lessons from John Bunyan's life. What made Bunyan the charming and abiding author that he is? His works, especially the Pilgrim's Progress, continue to be read, treasured, and appreciated the world over by Christians and non-Christians alike. How can a man with no formal education, none, who had forgotten to read after he left school and then had to relearn how to read later in life, who had no formal education, who didn't know any Greek, who didn't know any Hebrew, he had no theological degrees or training, how could he become the one that had become the endearing and enduring theological author that he remains today? Well, actually, his lack of formal training for John Bunyan was actually the key. John Burton wrote in the preface to Bunyan's first book in 1658, quote, This man, referring to Bunyan, is not chosen out of an earthly, but out of the heavenly university, the Church of Christ. He hath, through grace, taken these three heavenly degrees, to wit, union with Christ, the anointing of the Spirit, and the experiences of the temptations of Satan, which do more fit a man for that mighty work of preaching the gospel than all university learning and degrees that can be had. End quote. His temptations, Bunyan's temptations, Bunyan's sufferings, and Bunyan's radical conversion brought him to live constantly close to God in prayer and brought him to a constant and continual close study of the scriptures. He may have not studied the fathers or the reformers in depth, but he made a close study of scripture, his abiding delight, his labor of love. One author wrote, quote, he arrived at a remarkable knowledge of truth by his study of the scriptures with much prayer and meditation, end quote. Bunyan lived and wrote by his own faith, he said. I live and write and preach by my own faith. He says, quote, I honor the godly as Christians, but I prefer the Bible before them. And having that still with me, I count myself far better furnished than if I had without it all the libraries of the two universities, Cambridge and Oxford, end quote. In other words, Bunyan drank from his own cistern. Bunyan learned what God taught him in his holy word. This is what makes his books so timeless. They are eminently scriptural. As Spurgeon said in the quotation earlier, the secret of its freshness is that it is so largely compiled from the scriptures. Now we as Presbyterians and Reformed Christians prize an educated clergy. And rightly so. But we must remember that this too can become a snare. It's better to have a close acquaintance with God's book, practically applied, than to have read all the world's books and not know the Bible. Pastor Joel will tell us horror stories from Presbytery Floor often of men that get up there and, and pass their apologetics, their church history, their theology degree or, or exams. And then they say, have you read the Bible cover to cover? No, not yet. I'm working on that. But that's a real problem. It would be better that they knew the Bible intimately. That's what we want. Now, we don't have to sacrifice one for the other. We don't have to imitate Bunyan specifically here, where we should toss out all learning and toss out what, the church has, what God has given us through his church throughout the ages. That's not what we're saying. But it does highlight the importance of Scripture knowledge, of knowing God in and through the scriptures, especially in reform circles. There's always the newest book you need to read to, the newest podcast you need to listen to, the newest theology book you need to get, the newest issue and hot button thing. You know, we're experiencing some of this right now, right? But we must remember, we must have the scriptures. The scriptures must be preeminent. 
We must be Bible people more than anything else. We prize an educated clergy, but remember that it can become a snare. John Owen recognized this, being willing to trade all of his learning for bunions. In the preface to a series of lectures on the Pilgrim's Progress, Charles Spurgeon said this. I believe you can find this book. Uh, It's called Pictures from the Pilgrim's Progress. It's a series of lectures he gave on the different characters in it. He said this in the preface, Charles Spurgeon, quote, Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of the Lord. Not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our inmost parts. It is idle, useless, merely to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historical facts but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scripture models and what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. Now, Joel's, Pastor Joel's not here so I can talk about him, right? This is one of the things that everyone comments about our pastor. One of the things that is endearing about our pastor is that he knows the Bible. He preaches the Bible. Okay. That yes, he, he looks to other things. He knows his history. He knows his theology. He teaches it to us. But ultimately, he is a Bible preacher. Amen. He's a Bible man. And that's what we need to be, is Bible people who eat the Bible, who consume it until it's very, uh, in our very fiber, in our inmost being, as Spurgeon here says. He continues in this quotation from the preface, I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his, and you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He had read it till his very soul was saturated with Scripture. And though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel and say, Why, this man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere, and his blood is bibline. Cut him anywhere, and I'll just bleed Bible. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. I commend his example to you, beloved. End quote. Luther said that, Martin Luther said that three things make a truly good theologian. Oratio, meditatio, et tentatio. Prayer, meditation, and temptation. That's what makes a truly good theologian, a truly strong Christian. And these we have in John Bunyan. Bunyan was a man who knew the scriptures of God and, more importantly, the God of the scriptures. He had tested and applied all of the warnings and all of the promises of the scriptures to his own heart in life, and he had found them sure and steadfast. He knew that the sufferings and hard providences of God were used for his own good and the good of Christ's church, as we read earlier in Romans 8.28. He writes, quote, It is said that in some countries trees will grow, but will not bear fruit, because there is no winter there. End quote. Putting God's scripture promises to the test in the midst of trial and tribulation, Bunyan made them sure. Another place on this topic, he actually says this, quote, Look how fears have presented themselves, so have supports and encouragements. Yea, when I have started, when I've been startled, even as it were at nothing else but my own shadow, yet God, as being very tender of me, hath not suffered me to be molested but would with one scripture or another strengthen me against all, insomuch that I have often said, were it lawful, I could pray for greater trouble and trial, for the greater comfort's sake. End quote. He knew this lesson well, that putting God's word to the test, putting God to the test, and his promises to the test, in the midst of trials and tribulations and suffering, you would find them sure. To the point that he even said, If it were lawful, I'd start praying for more bad stuff to happen to me. So I could be comforted more. I could have more faith in God. His inspiration, Bunyan's inspiration, 
and his writing came not only from his own life, but also from the lives of those around him. He drew his characters from real examples and real people. One 18th century author said, quote, This is one of the most charming features of his allegory. It is all so natural and so true to life. End quote. Time fails us to tell of the amazing scenes of faith and masculine Christianity in his wife, Elizabeth. But she was made of the same stuff. The characters we so love in the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian, Christiana, Mercy, Mr. Fearing, Mr. Feeble-Minded, Mr. Ready to Halt, Judge Hategood, Hopeful, Faithful, and the inspiring escort of the Pilgrim's great heart. Bunyan knew them all personally. Personally. We can say little more today than tole lehe. Take up and read. And we can pray, O Lord, give us again John Bunyan's. I did have an appendix here that I printed out if we had time for it. Uh, One scene from Bunyan's second wife, Elizabeth, that I think is worth sharing. The year after their marriage, you remember that Bunyan was arrested and put in prison. And she was pregnant with her firstborn and she miscarried during the uh, the crisis and then had her four children that she inherited through that marriage to care for. She cared for the children as stepmother for 12 years alone. And then she bore Bunyan two more children, Sarah and Joseph, after his release. Elizabeth deserves at least one story, so I'll share one here. This is a story of her valor and how she went to the authorities in August 1661, a year after John's imprisonment and took matters into her own hands and confronted these judges and these magistrates that justice should be done. She met them with one stiff question, or she was met with one stiff question when she asked for his release. Would he stop preaching? My Lord, he dares not leave off preaching as long as he can speak. The judge responds, What what is the need of talking? There is need of this, my Lord, for I have four small children, that cannot help themselves, of which one is blind, and we have nothing to live upon but the charity of good people. One of the judges, Matthew Hale, with pity, asks if she uh, really has four children, even though she's so young at this time. My Lord, I am but mother-in-law to them, having not been married to him yet full two years. Indeed, I was with child when my husband was first apprehended, but being young and unaccustomed to such things, I being smayed at the news, I fell into labor, and so continued for eight days, and then was delivered, but my child died. Matthew Hale, one of the judges, was moved, but the other judges were hardened, and they spoke against her. He is a mere tinker, talking about John Bunyan, her husband. She responds, yes, and because he is a tinker and a poor man, therefore he is despised and cannot have justice of thee. One Mr. Chester is enraged at this and says that Bunyan will preach and do as he wishes. He says, he preacheth nothing but the word of God, she says to him. Mr. Twisden, in a rage, responds, he runneth up and down, and he doeth much harm. She responds, no, my lord, it is not so. God hath owned him and done much good by him. The man is so angry now, he says, his doctrine is the doctrine of the devil. She responds to this judge, saying, my lord, When the righteous judge shall appear, it will be known that his doctrine is not the doctrine of the devil. This continues back and forth. She didn't get anywhere with them, and they refused to see her. She kept trying to make new meetings with them throughout the years, and and there's one one instance in the life of of, uh, Elizabeth Bunyan where they refused to meet with her in person, and so she, she goes and throws the petition on their lap as they're driving by in the carriage once. Anyway, it's a, it's a great story. She was just a phenomenal, amazing, godly, strong woman. 